question now about curriculum. Generally, one of the first questions parents ask when they make this decision to homeschool is, uh, <coughs> even when they're still considering, is what curriculum should we use? In a way, that's kind of like asking what bus shall we take without knowing what the destination is. It does matter, doesn't it? Um, people homeschool for different reasons. And often this is uh, important to take into consideration when thinking about curriculum. Some have decided to homeschool because they felt God laid upon them the responsibility for their children's education. Others may have seen some devastating results of public education upon their family and decided to wrest control back from the system and to do for their family what the schools failed to accomplish. But either way, the issue seems to be one of responsibility. The question then comes to mind, if we take this responsibility and then deposit it on the shoulders of the curriculum, have we really assumed responsibility? Do you understand what I'm getting at here? You know, if I could just find the best possible curriculum then uh, I won't have to worry about my children's education. Well, that's like just looking for a better school. Because after all, curriculum was created for the school concept, classroom instruction, mass-produced education, as opposed to homeschooling, which I define as handcrafted education. So, I believe that curriculum is not necessary or even desirable, if we mean by curriculum, the textbooks and workbooks and other devices and materials created for classroom teaching. Instead, I would ask you to consider some other options. And again, keeping in mind that this is perhaps a goal to work toward gradually if your children have already been in school. I have here a quotation that was found in uh, Electronic Design in 1986, and it's from an article by Carol Patton titled, Projects Not Textbooks Keep Engineers Current. Now this, um, oh, I don't read that magazine, but someone else read it and found it, and I thought it was very apropos of the subject. It says, if your mid-career engineers are going stale, don't waste company money on formal continuing education courses, says Jay Gilbert, president of Professional Development Incorporated in New York. Gilbert believes that formal study courses waste dollars, eat up valuable company time and effort, and produce little return on investment. What is this talking about? This is a good one to read to reluctant dads who have trouble seeing how mom's going to be able to be a teacher to the children and get all the housework done and be available to him and so on. Uh, you know, sometimes natural learning solves that enigma in their mind. They can see how it really works. Okay, so this. This is uh, talking about business world and, and companies who s often send their mid-career uh, managers, middle management people back to college to learn management skills and so forth and so on. But he says this is a waste of money and time. The reason he gives is that the school model of continuing education, that is, teaching courses around some professor's assessment of learning needs conflicts with everything that science knows about how adults learn. Interesting how they singled out adults here. I don't think we learn differently than children, but, well, we don't want to damn the whole school system that's the major part of our country's economy, do we? So anyway, it only conflicts with how adults learn, <laughs> according to him. So instead, he says, in place of teachers and textbooks, 
try small work-related learning projects. In fact, because the projects correlate to real and immediate job needs, engineers automatically develop a sense of technological ownership and involvement that tutoring could never accomplish. Do you get the picture? Instead of sending these young men to college, give them a project to work on that will give them far more training than they'd ever get in a classroom, and they will be worth something to you as a business when they're done. Yes? I have a brother-in-law who's a facilitator in, uh, at Honeywell <coughs> in Phoenix, and he's the only facilitator they have, and it's a big complex. You know, if they need five chairs in another place, then he goes where they've got 30 chairs and only need 25, and puts up modules, and, and he's done that for them for years. Never went to college, and he was given a raise that was um, equal to the engineers in their company mm -hmm. just a couple months ago. Because he was valuable to them. Yes. And he'd learned on the job. That's the best place to learn. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more down at our level as mothers now about this work-related learning project concept. Um, it, it works obviously for engineers and many others in the work world and in the business world and so forth. But what about middle school? What about fourth grade? Is it going to work there too? <coughs> Washing dishes. Have you ever washed dishes, or do you all just have dishwashers nowadays? Dishwashers. As a child, you remember <laughs> washing dishes? <laughs> Did you learn anything from washing dishes? <laughs> okay, I keep hearing the little comments here. I want to I want to hear them individually. Somebody said hot water. What about hot water? Don't get it too hot. Don't get it too cold. Okay, did you ever try washing dishes in cold water? What happened? Some grease clings to the... Yeah, they don't get clean in cold water, do they? And uh, what else? You have to rinse them in hot water as well. Uh-huh, <laughs> because if you rinse them in cold water, it, you have to dry them. And if you drink, what, rinse them in hot water, they dry themselves. But if you rinse them in cold water, they rinse better. Then you rinse them in hot water. And then okay, so <laughs> cold water cuts the soap faster, yes. yes. I learned more of an attitude that if I just, if I just um, quit complaining and just get it done, then I have to do it anyway, so I might as well. I remember when I learned that as a kid. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, so do the unpleasant part first and get it over with, and then you can enjoy the fun afterwards, like dessert. I used to think of it in terms of food for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yes. One thing along scientific terms is when I was a kid first learning how to do dishes and form the bubbles in, when the light would hit the bubbles, I noticed that they made the neat colors. Well, at the end, I didn't know light refraction. Well, of course, that, that little curiosity, it open that door uh -huh. for me. Okay. Yes. I learned how to make a chore list. <laughs> <laughs> so it's divided up in the whole family because every one of us hate doing dishes. And if we have it only a couple days a week instead of every single day on one person, mm -hmm. there's a lot less resentment. Okay, so work management here. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm interested in this, this science learning. Um, I hated to do dishes too. So my solution was to make it fun. Consequently, it took me two or three hours to wash the dishes for the family floor. It's a lot of time. And my sister usually got out of drying them because it took me so long. So I learned to rinse them in hot water so I wouldn't have to dry them either. Well, anyhow, but didn't you ever take a glass and put it under the water and then turn it upside down and pull it partly out of the water and it stayed full of water? Remember that? What, what, what's happening? Why doesn't the water fall out of the glass as you lift it slowly? Vacuum. Yeah. 
That's a good start. <laughs> Nature abhors a vacuum, we're taught. Well, if the water fell out of the glass before it was there out of the water, there would be a vacuum in there. And you can prove this by inserting a bent straw under the rim of the glass so that the air can come down through and get in, get up in there, and then the water will fall out. Because then it's not a vacuum, it fills up with air. Well, later on, when we when, uh, had reason to want to know about vacuum and, and water and suction and all this kind of stuff, I still remember the picture of playing with the glass in the dish water. It makes sense in terms of the science involved. What are some other things that you did while washing dishes? Because my father was a minister, um, I often baptized the dishes. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was just children use any device to internalize or understand, digest the experiences that they have. And it was just part of my life. And so I played it in the dishes. And then one day, uh, he was invited to to another church of a different denomination that was very different from ours. And uh, of course, I went along and was very interested in all the differences, noting similarities and differences. Surprised when they sang a song that was familiar because everything else was so different. One thing that was very different that I noticed that was that by the door there was a little container of holy water that people did they do. I was fascinated. I was probably about nine years old. So next week when I was washing dishes, not only did they get baptized, they got sprinkled with holy water. Mm -hmm. Well, this is part of learning. And, and, and you know, some of you could have been standing over me telling me to hurry up and get done and learn it to be efficient. But this was not the time to learn to be efficient. This is the time to learn science or the time to learn comparative religions or whatever. <laughs> and so remember this with your children. It's what they are learning that's important. Don't derail the process. Don't say, no, you can't learn this today. You must learn how to be punctual. You must learn how to be efficient. When they are in the process of learning something scientific or whatever, they'll learn the others too. Believe me, life will teach it to them. But be sure that you don't derail their learning experiences. So work-related learning projects. It, children like responsibility, especially when they're little. Often we put them off. Well, you're too little to sweep the floor. Uh, you're too little to wash the dishes. Go play. Mama's busy. And we derail their <laughs> learning efforts. My daughter wanted to wash dishes when she was four. She made a mess in the kitchen, and she had to change her clothes afterwards. She was wet from head to toe, but she loved it. And so she became a very valuable helper to me. She would wash and scrub, and she loved to do it. Well, I hated it because nobody let me to do it until I was nine or ten. And by then, it wasn't fun anymore. She still likes to wash and scrub. Maybe not as much. <laughs> <laughs> Take advantage of those wanting to learn. Give them some responsibility. And, and if they like something, fine. If, if, if they want to go from one responsibility to another, that's fine, too. They're trying it all out. Um, rotate it. I know when you have siblings and you have to divide up the chores and, and nobody wants to do any of it, it's hard. But that's life too. We, if we're going to homeschool, mom can't do everything. We need to help share the responsibility. But give them, give a little. Let them, let them decide some of it among themselves. Who's better to do what chores? And they'll be learning important lessons in that area too. Okay, so well what what do you feel like you're gonna be missing out on a lot if you're not
not using textbooks in curriculum? Not to. <laughs> if if you still uh, have a question about this, I suggest that you think before you rush out and spend several hundred dollars worth on textbooks and materials for school, that you ask yourself some questions. First of all, what are your goals? What do you really want for your child? A high school diploma? Anyone who sat in a classroom for 11,970 hours will be issued a diploma whether or not they learned anything. I mean, it's sad, but that's the truth. I have met people who graduated from high school, diploma in hand, that were illiterate, could not read. How many hours is that? 11,970 hours in the state of Washington. It varies a little bit from one state to another. <laughs> Do I dream of providing the most well-rounded and effective education for my child? Why not trust that magnificent brain that was born motivated to learn? <laughs> Is there a better way than the schooling that we and our parents received? Well, yes. There's the old way that was in use for thousands of years. What system of education produced the geniuses of past generations? Well, some of it might have been time and chance, but they had strong families, and there was lots of hard work and time to play. What curriculum was chosen by the parents of Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Edison, General George Patton, Leonardo da Vinci, even Christ and Moses were self-taught or home-educated. These people read their biographies, they did their own learning, their own thinking. And what is the worst thing that could happen if I dispense with curriculum and just spend time answering my child's answering my child's questions? The worst thing that could happen is that some days the beds won't get made because there are so many questions to answer. What is the best thing that could happen is that you will find yourself getting acquainted with a very wonderful person, your child, and a very well-kept secret about homeschooling is that you'll find yourself getting educated because children ask these wonderful questions. So if you have money burning a hole in your pocket and you're trying to figure out how to spend it for educational purposes, here's a list. Well, consider encyclopedia. That's a good thing to have, although it doesn't have to be the latest edition, and believe me, the markdown on used ones is tremendous. <laughs> Maps, globe, some sound equipment, perhaps, musical instruments. The typical contents of a desk drawer is wonderful compass, ruler, protractor, and so forth. You might subscribe to some magazine, scientific, nature, uh, educational type magazine. In invest in some craft <coughs> supplies, paint, art supplies, building toys, microscope, at least a good magnifying field guide so that when you go for walks out in the fields in the forest, you can help your children identify the things that they find. Telescope, gardening equipment, computer, on and on. Do you get the picture? Yeah, you can spend money at this, but it's fun. This is real valuable stuff to have for learning. Yes? What about, what about nouns and verbs and adverbs and you know, well, now we're going to spend a lot of time tomorrow talking about that in our next session. Uh, but the language that you use, that your children hears every day, is going to give them the best foundation in grammar and so forth. But you can get some games that will help them to learn the parts of speech.
isn't that important if when our children are required by the state of Washington to take an SAT test? Are we not supposed to be showing some advancement? Oh, yes. <coughs> My children never had any trouble passing it. Not that there's something to pass, but they always scored high on their standardized achievement test. Though they did this natural learning. Because we talk about it. The subject comes up. I mean, I remember one day when um, my my youngest, I was tucking him in bed. He was probably about four or five, somewhere in there. And uh, he, he asked this question, how long till my birthday? And I started going through the process of figuring it out. And he said, I, I know what month it is. And then he proceeded to recite all the 12 months in order. And I said, where did you learn that? I didn't teach that to you. Well, I learned it. I don't know why. And I thought about it for quite a while, and I figured that in the course of our conversation, from day to day, we use those terms. We talk about what month the birthdays are in, and we talk about what month this is, and we talk about what month certain holidays are in, and it's like the pattern again, that they hear enough of it, they've plugged it in. They've got the Christmas is in December, my birthday's in whatever month it is, you know, and, and mom's birthday is here, and this is the month that we're going to go on vacation, and pretty soon it's all filled in, and they know. They don't know how they know. And the same works for the parts of speech if you talk about it. That's the key. Talk about it. What if I need that structure? I think it's me on. Well, it didn't do you much good in the first time you went through it, did it? You mean for you to learn, or you need the script structure in your time with, with your child? That, yeah, in my so that I know that, that I'm getting every, that they're getting everything that they're supposed to be getting. What can I say? You will. The, the teacher thinks when when they pass you to the next grade that you know this stuff that she presented to you, and you don't, you don't know it. You just covered it. Have you ever heard the term, cover the subject, cover the material? What is that? That doesn't mean learn it. That doesn't mean know it. Well, I have teachers that I did learn from. Oh, sure, but not from all of them. Because they sat down and made it something that was interesting for me. Yeah, so so what you're asking me for- If I'm taking on the homeschooling project uh, of responsibility, then I should be able to work that in so that this is interesting for my daughter and yeah. my son, and that they will learn from it, then I need that structure to be able to do that. I mean, I need to know what they need to learn this next. Well, and fine, I, and that may be your natural way of learning and helping your child learn. And if your child gets after you, I know I have I know one mother uh, who took this class. She has two boys, and one of them wanted the structure, and so they ordered correspondence course material, and he plowed through that and went went on to college, and he's a bright, well educated boy. But the other one was a one of those free spirits. You could not set him down at a desk to save his life. He would never complete a workbook without grief. And she let go. She let go and let him learn his own way. This young man now is employed. He's a successful adult. But he went a different route. And it worked better for him. So it's up to you, you know, and your child to work it out. I'm just saying that if you think you have to go the school route at home. You don't. If you want to, that's your choice. If it works best for you, fine. Obviously, it, it works for some people, or there wouldn't be such a thing in school. You know, but it doesn't work for a lot of people. Yes? As my son gets older, he's going to be in fifth grade, he's going to be getting into math areas that I know nothing about what do you do? Oh, I had a couple of things <laughs> like that. Um, one of them plugged into the computer when he was 13, 
I worried about his health because he didn't do anything. He'd get up early in the morning when the rates were cheap, contact all the bulletin boards in the country. This was before email and all of that came out. And he would download games and whatnot. And then he'd spend the rest of the day on the computer and, and learning all this stuff that I thought was totally useless. But in the process, he became interested in math and programming. He had to know math. By the time he was 16, people were paying him $20 an hour as a consultant. But as the, as the mother, what did you do? I didn't contribute to that at all. Well, he learned it himself. He would ask his dad quite often. Uh, he would sometimes ask other people. Sometimes he would figure it out in his own head. Don't underestimate the ability of our own minds to figure things out. What I always come back to in this area is, who taught the first person? Who taught Pythagoras his theorems? Where did it come from? Our educational system is based on the old Greek myth Mm -hmm. That the gods came down and give out gifts of wisdom and then you had to sit at these people's feet and eat out of their hand and learn what they had to offer. And that was the only way to learn. Mm -hmm. You have to go to school and sit at the, in front of a teacher who will impart knowledge to you that you cannot know any other way. That's a myth, as I said at the beginning. Everything that is known began inside of somebody's mind who looked, observed patterns, experiences, and understood, and then found a way to share it with others. So our children can rediscover math the way the first people discovered it. Yes? Do you think it's necessary to, to invest in a computer if we don't, you know, we don't have one right now? Oh, I wouldn't say that it's necessary. I would definitely say it's highly desirable. But no, not necessary. I mean, some of us have lived without running water <laughs> or electricity. And it's possible. And, and children get a good education even without water, running water and electricity. But it's highly desirable to have them. Yes. And so if you're not buying $900 worth of textbooks, you've got something to play around with and save up for a computer. And you don't have to buy them straight off the shelf. You can look in the one ad, that's where I often used to shop for, yeah, because they do, the, you know, the people are always upgrading and getting rid of the stuff at a much reduced price. Also, in the public library in Spokane downtown has computers, yeah. and every so often they'll offer classes free of charge if you have a card to teach you um, access on the internet and different, just your normal mm -hmm. how to use a computer. If, if you're shopping in the used department, you need to establish, first of all, if you want to go online or not. Because if you want to go online, then that eliminates the older computers. You can still buy them used that will get you online, but you, did, you do need to know that. If you just want to start with a computer for the basic knowledge of computers, anything, you know, doesn't matter how old it is. But as new as you can afford is the best. And you know, this item at the bottom of the list, a place in the country, I think that's really worth a lot. I think it's worth a college education. You know, if you wonder how you're gonna send your child to college, it might be cheaper to buy a place in the country and they won't need to go to college. <laughs> okay. Now, um, we need to move on. That's learning from work. Let's talk now about learning from play. If you're not doing textbooks and curriculum all day long, what are you doing? What are your children doing? I hope so. We often see puppies and kittens playing with each other, chasing their tails, pouncing on butterflies and so forth, and, and we smile and say, well, they're practicing survival skills. No, you know, this isn't playing, this is practicing survival skills. But when our children are racing toy cars or serving tea to their dolls and so forth, we think it's a waste of time. They're playing, they should be working or studying. But aren't those survival skills too? Yes. One thing I noticed when my daughter plays with her dolls and stuff, she's learning a lot of socialization skills. She's working it out in her mind how these dolls should be speaking to each other. 
and therefore she's learning etiquette, something that they don't even teach in school. Right. Yes. Play is extremely important in learning. The pity is mm -hmm. that there's so little time for play there in school. Scientists studying chimpanzees have observed that young animals deprived of their mothers did not play the way others did. During the first four or five years of life, chimps are in close contact with their mothers and have plenty of time to observe adult behavior and incorporate what they observe into their play. Jane Goodall and her colleagues studying free-ranging chimpanzees in Tanzania reported a striking example of how this early observation together with play leads to skilled adult behavior. Uh, Jane Goodall discovered that chimpanzees had developed a new skill, and this was at the time hailed as a wonderful scientific discovery of animals uh, acquiring a skill or inventing a skill, if you will, and which included preparing tools. In fact. Um, she observed chimpanzees, adult chimpanzees, who would break off twigs, sticks, peel the bark from them, put them in their mouth, get them wet, and then poke them into termite holes. The termites would stick to those twigs, and then they would be pulled out and eaten. So they were fishing for termites. And uh, she thought this was very ingenious. I would have wondered who the first chimpanzee was that invented this. <laughs> but anyway, so she, she made a note of it and wrote about it. And then she noticed that the young chimpanzees learned this skill piecemeal by washing adults. She observed young chimpanzees who played with sticks or sat in a corner peeling the bark off of lots of sticks, just peeling bark all day long, or going around with sticks poking them in holes indiscriminately. They weren't interested in ter termites, they were probably still on mother's milk, but they would go around poking sticks into holes. Have you ever seen little kids do this? One time we were visiting an apiary, uh, two or three families of us, and uh, the beekeeper was down, you know, showing us the hive and trying to take one apart to show us the queen bee. So we were all very intently peering over his shoulder. He would smoke them out so they would be, uh, you know, not stinging us. And we totally forgot this little toddler who was finding his own entertainment, walking, toddling down the orchard pathway. Bee beehives are often kept in orchards because there's so many flowers there and it's good for the orchard and the bees. Um, lots of twigs there too, by the way, <laughs> pruning and so on. He found a twig and proceeded to find a hole. He poked his twig stick into the hole and stirred it up and all these bees came swarming out. You know, found another little hole at the bottom of the next hive and poked his stick in the hole and stirred it up and all the bees came swarming out. And the little chap never got stung, though the rest of us all got stung. <laughs> But he was doing what comes naturally, poking sticks in holes. Well, anyway, presumably this is how the young chimps eventually put all these skills together of peeling bark, of finding twigs, of poking them in holes, eventually discovered how to catch termites. <clears throat> but one young chimp, Jane Goodall observed, who had lost his mother in his third year and was raised by older siblings, never learned this special skill of termiting. She said he lacked the opportunity to observe an adult closely. And he did not get the buffering from external pressure that a mother normally provides. That's when I thought about that daycare scenario. You know, how do children learn anything in that setting? There's not an adult to model after. The, the caregiver doesn't count. That's not normal adult activity. There's no mother there to buffer them from the pressures of all these other kids that terrorize them. It's scary. You don't learn when you're afraid. 
certain parts of the brain shut down under tension and stress and fear. So you don't learn. <clears throat> Just like this young chimp that was an orphan did not learn the skill that everyone else had learned so easily. Some have concluded, therefore, that play is indeed important not only to survival, but it provides practices of subroutines and sequences of behavior that later come together in skilled action and useful problem solving. Well-known psychologist and researcher Jerome Bruner studied the effect of play on the problem-solving abilities of children. He and his colleagues designed an experiment where three to five-year-olds were given the task of fishing a prize from a box that was out of reach. The only way they could do this was to extend two sticks by using a clamp, thus making a pole with which to reach the prize. Now, for, for the purposes of, of I'm going to grab a couple of things here. For the purposes of this uh, example, let's convert it to a math problem just to help you see what's going on here. Uh, they divided the children into several groups. The first group was shown or taught by an adult who demonstrated how to clamp sticks together. Okay? Now, let's say we want to learn how to add two and two. And I can show you how to do this on the blackboard, for example, this way. Two plus two equals four. Okay, do you know how to add now? The second group of children were shown, or rather were drilled in the skill of fastening clamp a clamp on a stick. So this is, experiment was involving getting that prize out of the basket that was out of reach. So now they were shown not how to get the prize, but they were now drilled in the process of clamping sticks together. So I could have you all write down this problem in your notebook five times. And then would you know how to add? The third group Watch the experimenter carry out the entire task of making the pole and fishing the prize out of the basket. Now, do you think they knew how to do it? Okay, so if I showed you, I have two blue sticks here, and here's two other colored sticks. Now watch, one, two, three, four. Two blue ones and two other colors make four. Do you understand now how to add? That makes more sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you see how it's done? This doesn't relate to adding, but this does. Okay, the fourth group received no training at all, but was simply given the opportunity to play with the material. They were put in a room with a prize out of reach. There were some sticks laying around, some clamps, etc. And the kids had at it. They did what kids do. They played. Eventually, they were able to solve the problem. Just like if I gave these to you to play with, and you were a child, you might spend a lot of time sticking them together. You might make towers out of them. You might start getting interested, let's see, there's one, two, three different colors, and then there's one more, so three and one make four. And you might say two blue ones and two other colors, and eventually you would find that two and two make four. Wouldn't you? Probably. Okay. The fifth group received no prior exposure to the material, that was the test group. And what they found was quite impressive. It says the results were quite impressive. The children who only played with the material were able to solve the problem as well as the one, as the, as the ones who watched the complete solution demonstrated and were twice as successful as the ones who were taught the principle or who practiced the necessary skill. So in other words, the ch each of these groups of children were then placed in a room 
for a certain given amount of time, I suppose, to see if they had figured out how to get that prize. The children who were first taught how to clamp sticks together. The children who practiced clamping sticks together. The children who saw the entire demonstration. Well, of course, they knew what to do when they got in that room and wanted the prize. And so did the children who just went in there and played and found the answer. So, if you want your children to learn to add, or if you want them to learn the parts of speech and all the rest, play. Just play. Let, give them toys to play with. How many children building Legos have figured out not only adding but multiplying? Because they have to count the little bumps on the Lego bricks. And pretty soon, they're really good at it. They can tell you in an instant what size blocks go with which to produce a certain length and so on. And so that's what Bruner observed, that play was just as successful as the whole demonstration. He said, we were quite struck by the tenacity with which the children in the play group stuck to the task. Even in their initial, when their initial approach was misguided, they ended by solving the problem because they were able to resist frustration and the temptation to give up since they were only just playing. Uh, other researchers have found that the opportunity for play affects a child's later creativity. Play serves as a vehicle for language acquisition and helps a child assimilate experiences to his personal understanding of the world. Language acquisition? Have you ever listened to children talking to themselves and they try to use grown-up words and tones? Uh, one time my grandkids were over visiting and one of them was playing outside and the other one was sitting at the kitchen table playing with Play-Doh. I think it was probably three or four at the time. And the one outside came running in and asked me a question. I don't remember what the question was, but I gave him a flippant little answer like, oh, I don't know. And so he said, thank you, Grandma, went out to play. After a few minutes, I heard this little voice over at the kitchen table going, oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. What's going on here? How does Grandma get that flippant tone in her voice? How does, how does that work? Can I make that sound? It sounded funny. It grabbed his interest. He practiced it. He's playing. That's how they learn. Okay? We, we now know that play is serious business. Indeed, the principal business of childhood. It is a vehicle of improvisation and combination the first carrier of rule systems through which a world of cultural restraint replaces the operation of childish impulse. Have you ever tried playing checkers with a five-year-old? <laughs> what happens? Generally, by the time they're five or so, they have figured out that games are to be won, and they want to win. But they don't yet understand the concept of rules. So they want to change the rules. And in my compulsive days of uh, early motherhood, I would say, no, the rules say this, and you have to do it. And pretty soon, the kids didn't want to play anymore, because they didn't understand that part of it. Now, as a grandmother, I say, OK, change the rules. And when it's my turn, I change the rules. <laughs> and then they see why we have rules. Play helps them. And also, haven't you seen two little girls playing? They're going to play house. So they try to decide, I'll be the mommy and you be the daddy. No, I don't want to be the daddy. I'll be the, I'll be the neighbor. Or I'll be the aunt or whatever. OK, well, let's, this will be the dining room and that will be the bedroom. And, no, 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 this is going to be the kitchen. And they go on and on for hours trying to establish the rules of the game until you want to tear your hair out. Like, can you just play now? Mm -hmm. Now it's almost time to go home. <laughs> <laughs> They've been playing all along. Mm -hmm. Once they get the rules all established, they'll decide they're done playing, and they'll go do something different. That is playing. So this is how play 
coax them to learn about rules. And maybe if children had much more time to play, then we wouldn't have wars in the world because they would have learned how to dialogue and, and bargain and work through and develop rules and, and we'd have peace. Too often parents interfere with this process. Of course, if they come to blows, we have to. But <laughs> remember, they've got to learn how rules work and they have to learn how to establish them. Play is the way. According to Benjamin Bloom, professor of education at the University of Chicago, about 95% of today's classroom teaching focuses on the lower mental processes, rote learning of grammar, multiplication tables, historical names and dates. Most teachers spend very little time on the higher mental processes of problem solving, analyzing, and interpreting. And yet, in a number of recent studies, Bloom and others found that as children improve their thinking skills, there was a gain in the rote learning too. Knowing what an idea or a principle means and how it can be applied helps a child to learn better and remember longer. It's these higher mental processes that are the ones being exercised in play. Little children trying to fish out prize out of a box must analyze and interpret the situation. Trying various solutions exercises the ability to interpret the results and eventually leads to problem solving. And so when they're racing cars or building Lego brick space stations or serving tea to their dolls, they're learning, they're pra practicing the higher mental processes that they will be using the rest of their life to solve problems. Play is very important. Now, we're going to take a um, break, but I would like for you to be thinking about your childhood experiences with play. And when we come back, we'll develop this a little bit more before we go on. Okay? So think of, come back to class with some stories from your childhood play experience. Any questions burning in your mind that you have to get answered before we go on? Curious what you um, uh, did you already talk to her about the attention deficit disorder? That's right. We were going to get back to that. Way. And and you mentioned the speech problem, mm -hmm. and that you, he's in speech therapy, and he's only seven years old. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I'm not a diagnostician, and I'm not a professional, and so forth. But I. Uh, had a, a child that had a speech impediment, and uh, I have another child that, if it had gone to school, probably would, probably in those days, would have been labeled retarded, though he's not. Well, he is. That's what they said that he was mentally retarded. Well, so I'm sure this way. boy would have been labeled that way also uh -huh. if he had been exposed <clears throat> to the labeling. Um, but there's nothing wrong. With his mind, he's slow. Right. He's now an electronic engineer and skillful in many other areas, but nobody ever told him that he couldn't learn, so he went ahead and learned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just took him longer right. to get there. I have another child, that, a couple of them, that would have been labeled gifted, but they didn't know that either. <laughs> so they didn't arrive into their adult life with false expectations of the world being handed to them on a platter because they're smart, quote unquote. They just learn faster. You know, the child that learned to walk at eight months is really no more successful than the one that learned to walk at 16 months. Mm -hmm. They just learn faster. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily more. Sometimes it works out to be more, but not always. Uh, the child that learned, that, that, that had the speech problem, by the time she was four or five, I could barely understand her, and her grandparents couldn't understand her at all, though they lived close by and were around her a lot. And it worried me a little bit. Uh, besides 
not speaking clearly, it, she also lisped. And uh, yet, when we went to visit a family that were Australian, uh, that we, they were living over here, and we went and spent a week with them, and, and one day the mother said to me, how did you teach your daughter to speak so clearly? Mm. And after that, I listened to her more closely, and yeah, she had an Australian accent. That's why we couldn't understand her. <laughs> <laughs> And then another one had a German accent when he was a baby. Yeah. I mean, my perception of it was that. Most babies, when they first start to talk, don't talk clearly. Some of them do. Uh, I, I have a little grandson right now who's just turned two. And he speaks in full, long sentences, but you can barely make out what he's saying. He just slurs it all and runs it all together. But I suppose we might find some people on the earth somewhere that could understand him clearly. And so little by little, they learn not only the syntax, but also the correct pronunciation of words. Some of them learn quickly, others learn slowly. Until you tell them that they're dumb, mm -hmm. and then they don't learn anymore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my answer, I guess, is be patient, and if you want to take him out of the speech therapy class, go for it. He'll probably learn just as quickly without it as with it. If you want to leave him in, I'm not going to tell you you shouldn't, but, you know, <clears throat> if he's hearing correct speech at home, there's only two reasons why he's not speaking that way himself. One, he needs more time to mature. And two, he could have a hearing defect, which they probably already checked out. Yeah, they, they checked that, and he's okay there. So I if he not, doesn't have a hearing problem, yeah. then he just needs more time. Okay, I see. And, and let's focus on it. You know, if, it's a, if it becomes a problem, then it's a problem. Right. If he doesn't think of it as a problem, then it'll go away. Just right. like the boys who learn to read when their mother quit working on it. But, yes. I used to work with some ADD and then ADHD with the preschool children, and I found that many of them, I mean, this is chemically imbalanced in their brains, so they, it was a real problem. But I found that they did learn, and they were generally bright one on one, and they did learn. Lots of praise, lots and lots of praise. So I think you're going to find a lot of success there to try that. Well, you know, the question isn't, is there a chemical imbalance yeah. in the brain? The question is, it's, which came first? Yeah, that's it. Which came first? The boredom, which produced a drug to deaden the brain so you won't feel the pain, or was there a chemical imbalance that produced the dead attention? The point that you were trying to get across was like push that aside and, and focus on just taking the child at their pace. Well yeah, if you if any of you have had experience in gardening, you plant your peas and some of them <laughs> shoot right out of the ground and grow for a while. And maybe all they have is leaves. Others grow very slowly and they creep up. And maybe they produce and maybe they don't. Others have just covered with peas and hardly any leaves and you wonder how they manage. And everyone does it differently. Is there anything wrong with the pea because they grow slow or fast? <laughs> is there anything wrong child because he walks at 16 months instead of at 8. Is there anything wrong with a child that takes a standardized achievement test and he's below grade level in some subjects? And is there any special gift in the child that aces it? Well, in our way of thinking there may be but actually, it may be a burden that that child has to bear the rest of their life. They have to sit around and wait while everybody else figures it out. You know? That's not necessarily a gift. It's just different. That's basic.
With my daughter and her processing and her uh, hyper, she, she's between hyperactivity and, a, and attention deficit. We took all processed sugar away from her and it helped. Mm -hmm. I mean, a world oh, yeah. difference. We, yeah. we switched to honey and to dextrose, and the change in the child was just night to day. Yeah, I, I believe, uh, get back to your comment about ADD. Right off the bat, my opinion of those labels are, first of all, they are a way of covering up future ineptitude. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, right. Oh, I has a problem with this label. <clears throat> the teacher hasn't figured out or didn't bother to try to understand this child's learning need, that he doesn't learn by hearing, he learns by doing or seeing. And so since the teacher didn't bother to figure it out, the child's not going to bother to figure her out and understand what she's trying to get across to him. And that if you give that child something that he was genuinely interested in, he would not lack any attention to what he was interested in. He would be perfectly able to concentrate. It's like they throw them all in the same bucket, and if they aren't going to perform the same way, and they slowly but surely get but plucked out and sit into these categories. Of course, somebody's going to say to me, but after a while, them. That, that, that there are some children that are dam genuinely damaged. Yes, but again, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You can be in that setting so long that it becomes permanent. I think they're saying that they're, what they're trying to say, the, the impression that I got was that it was okay for him to attend a resource so that they can have, it can be a confined thing. But the teacher didn't want him in the classroom because they had to take time and if he couldn't sit still, they didn't want him there. Or if he was disrupting with the class or whatever, sure. they didn't want him there. Sometimes I think we should take a second look and realize that the disruptive ones are the, are the ones who figured out what they need and are doing it. The ones that finally comply and sit quietly. I really, pathetic because they all their life will be passive victims. Well, that's another way of looking at it, yes. My son is um, so active, you, you can hardly get his attention. And um, I worry a lot about that, you know, with going into the homeschooling. But um, he's so smart, he, he does that. He mm -hmm. picks it up, I think, really fast. You might want to look into the diet issue to help them calm down a little bit. There are just a number of things that uh, will affect that. The the diet will play a major role in, in their exercise too, taking from the right. mm -hmm. and go and explore. But there's a whole uh, herbal values that will help them. And, and children that are just high strung, that because their minds are, are operating at maximum speed, uh, their, their bodies have to keep up somehow, you know, and so they need to, the, the balance, it's a balancing act between their physical and their mental. Sometimes doing it in spurts, like 10, 15 minutes, and then stopping for a long time, and then coming back to it or whatever, kind of gets them back to uh, an interest in it, too, instead of just sitting with them constantly or working with them constantly. Yeah, because yeah, when it's something he wants to do. Yeah, they're really interested. Yeah. So, That's a why fight it? Why not just work with that? I used to think that children were lumps of clay that we should form into what we thought they should become. I repent of that now. <laughs> children come to us with all the instructions and the plan and the, their program to become something, and it's our job to find out what that is, right. to figure them out, not the other way around, to program them. They're not little blanks. Have all this genetic material that that influences them and affects them, and our job is to figure out how to enhance it, not destroy it. Well, anyway, <clears throat> um, let's get back to the subject of play now. I'm going to read just a little bit here, and then I want to hear your stories. This is taken from a book by 
by Bruno Middleheim, a good enough parent. It says, the more opportunity a child has to enjoy, this isn't, I'm sorry, this isn't in your soul, this is additional, this a couple of things I want to read. The more opportunity a child has to enjoy the richness and freewheeling fantasy of play in all its forms, the more solidly will the development proceed. This is why culturally deprived children who had little chance to play, or little played with by parents, have such a hard time in school. Without the experience of succeeding in play, they do not trust themselves to succeed in school. Children, he goes on to say, lose out on, uh, lose out on a great deal if TV viewing or even such activities as academic learning prevent them from having rich experiences with both play and games. Not just TV. We keep knocking television all the time, and, and maybe we should, but what about academic learning? Can we make too much out of this? Like the lady that was in the master class and, and, and had not yet discovered what sort of person she was, or should have become, and was just then finding out. So too much academic learning prevents us from developing properly. Play is the ideal. Okay, one other article that I wanted to quote from appeared in Child Magazine, and uh, where the article, uh, the, the author was talking about uh, play and, and discussing how in some cities there's a, you know, committees that want to work out the, the playgrounds and build and, and have all this structured play for children. In fact, I think even here locally there's, there's a lot of effort put into the summer programs to keep children busy and off the streets and so on. And so this one group was having a discussion along these lines and many experts sounded the theme of giving back to children control over their play and exercise. Control to initiate play themselves and the freedom to do it when and how they wish. Uh, one of the spearheads of this movement was Dr. Hart, a different Dr. Hart, and he said children are already in enough situations where adult, adults direct and organize them. If, for instance, parents set up their children's activities in terms of time and space, going to a mini gym at a certain time of the week, for example, then the children are playing less. They lose control over their activities, they lose social autonomy, and they lose an opportunity to daydream and create. When you ask people what they remember most about their childhood, said Dr. Hart, they remember the places not designed for anything. Found places, empty lots, a ditch at the end of the garden, hiding places under bridges. It's these forgotten places that children want, he said, because there they can create their own meaning. That's when children forget time, when they fantasize and invent their own world, playing without deadlines or goals. Going to a children's gym instead teaches kids to become consumers rather than creators of things. Do you get the picture? So structure in learning doesn't work too well, but structure in play doesn't work very well either. I remember one time I was teaching this class um, in a, at a community college in the middle part of the state, and at the beginning of the school year, they were finishing up some remodeling at the local public school, and they weren't quite ready when school started. And so they bused the children to the community college whose classes would begin a few weeks later. So, but nevertheless, I was teaching this class there, and every now and then it would be recess time and the children we'd watch them file past the windows out onto the grass and the teachers were out there playing with them and maybe it was necessary in that situation because they were on a foreign campus without the usual fences and so on but i suspect that it happens on campus uh, on the school grounds as well the teachers were directing the play the children came out in single file from the classroom stood waiting in line while the teachers directed them where to stand, where, what to do. Um, 
they had a, a parachute and they formed a ring around it holding the parachute and then children would run back and forth. But you know, the children didn't look like they were having fun. Maybe it was a break from the classroom activity, but they didn't look like they were enjoying it. And they just waited to be told what to do. I don't call that playing. What would happen if the teachers had just backed off and let them be? Let them do their own thing. I wonder what would have happened. All right, what do you remember about playing as a child? Let's have some stories. Do you have any? Okay. Uh, well, we lived, we grew up in Tacoma, and out we were straining stitches out in front of our house, and my dad used to let us go out and, and build boats in the garage, just with nails and whatever we wanted to build, but we could do saw the hacksaw and stuff. And then we go out and we go our boat That sounds like fun. That sounds like real play. <laughs> And you probably learned about buoyancy and all sorts of scientific things you weren't aware of. Okay, come on, this. yes. Well, this doesn't exactly have happy in any of it. It uh, started out as fun. Remember, my little brother and I, uh, we were pretty little, I think it was only first grade. We were tossing a rock back and forth. We were great fun playing baseball. Well, it's going okay as long as we caught it. <laughs> But I missed one and it hit the side of the face and cut my face just a little. It hurt really bad, but I learned how hard a rock could be. And <laughs> that stuck with me even into geology in high school. It stuck with me because when he when he was standing up front going, you know, okay, now you know, now let's test the hardness of these rocks, you know, gold and all this. And I we got to the granite and we're going, that's pretty hard. <laughs> It's, it's fascinating how just any little thing can turn into a learning experience. You wouldn't want somebody to throw no. a diamond at you because that's <laughs> really hard. <laughs> okay, uh, did you ever take a ball apart? Uh, yes, we did. And find out why they don't yeah. hurt as much as a rock. Yes, we did. We oh, found balls. out what was inside the, the core uh -huh. of the cushioning. And my brother started that, but I kind of helped. We wound it and it took forever to unwind it. We got it done. Okay. Next. Anybody else? Yes. I, I did a lot in Iowa. My dad was a recruiter in the Marine Corps, and we lived there for four years. And we didn't live in the country, but right next to it. <coughs> um, actually, the Dane is a pretty big campus town. But we went and picked berries all the time, and honeysuckles, and we played Pioneer. And I remember making mud pies in the back alley. And my brother had magnets. I don't know where he could, but we played in the um, gutters in the front street and I remember getting the lead out of the street so we played with lead. I probably have lead for this city. <laughs> but I remember you, we thought it was so cool we'd get glass and drag it on top and get the lead to, you know, like an inch of sketch or something. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, we played forever and ever outside. It was, it was great. Unless you ate it, you probably, probably yeah, think I'll say it. Well, while the rest of you are thinking of some more stories, <laughs> um, the first time I read this article, I asked my spouse at the time if he remembered about playing, and he said, yeah, he remembered that he had an old board and had some bent nails sticking out of it and whatnot, and in his imagination, it was a high-tech plane. He loved stories of aviation so on and so in his play this board became the cockpit of a plane and, and the, he added a few more nails and so forth and they were the dials and the gauges on the panel and uh, and he played for hours with that thing. Later as an adult he went back to grandma's farm one day and out behind the garage he found this old board and he looked at it in utter disdain. How could that old board with rusty nails sticking out have been so much fun? And he realized that it was only a prop for him in his imagination. In fact, when I ask this question, I hardly ever hear of toys. Though I'm sure, you know, people have varying amounts of toys when they're growing up. 
but generally we don't we may re remember receiving them we may remember setting up the train set once or twice but not playing with it we may pl remember playing with dolls because you, they don't do anything you have to do it to them and uh, so on but most toys we don't remember them we remember the things that we made we remember the things that we did whether it was cowboys and Indians or you know, digging the lead out of the ditch or whatever. It's because those are the learning experiences. Any other stories? Yes. When I was a girl, I'm, I had two younger sisters and we lived in the mountains. We had no neighbors, probably like 10 miles away were the closest neighbors. And we had horses and such and we would, um, oh gosh, during the summer almost every day, we would get on our horses bareback and we'd have our sticks with yarn that were our bows and arrows and we would, my sisters and I played in the mountains constantly. Um, Indians, we were always Indians. Mm -hmm. And we would ride our ponies and we would fish and we would, you know, we'd have our sandwiches and stuff packed with us or whatever, but that was our pemmican and this was this and we just had everything. And all summer long, every day, it was just another continuing adventure of wild Indians. <laughs> we would braid our hair in the morning and it, we just did it all the time. Can you remember the source of the stories that were going through your head? Oh, uh, we used to fight over who was going to be Sacagawea. Yeah. I mean, so I don't even somebody, know if she rode a horse, but... <laughs> somebody read to you. Oh, yeah. And my dad was always very interested in, in teaching us about the mountain men and the trappers and different things because that was something he was interested in. And I don't know if it's normal for little girls to try and be, always be interested in what their dads are interested in, but it was something that all three of us really liked. And so we would pretend that we were the, you know, the Indian girls that the trappers married or whatever, you know. But we were always playing that every day, it seemed like. Okay, Some, sometimes our play is based on movies that we've seen or books that we've read or have been read to us or maybe it's based on stories that grandparents told us. But almost always that kind of play is acting out something that we've heard or seen that we want to understand better. So we play it. I just have one real bold memory of us organizing a circus in the whole neighborhood. We had signs up we had chairs sat out for all the customers and we took the money. I think we charged five cents to get in. And we gave a whole circus performance and we had costumes. And, and that's just a wonderful time. But I just remember too, just playing all the time and having all kinds of make believe. Um, we'd make up forts in the woods, we lived near the woods. And, and those forts were like our other home. <laughs> we just go there every day and just. Um, my girlfriends and I always we were always wearing costumes. <laughs> Look back on that one. <laughs> Some kind of costumes. <laughs> but um, just do your just children play, play this way now? Yeah. Um, especially my son. Yeah, he does. How about the rest of you? Do your children play like I you do dress up all the time? I see kids now and I think this is really weird because we used to play and we did role playing back in and playing house and buying ears. But I hear the kids now, uh, the neighbor kids will come over and they're always telling each other what they're going to say. I don't ever remember doing that. I always remember. I just say whatever I thought was appropriate and my sister or friend would. Now they're saying, well, then you'll say and then I'll say. And I just think that's so odd. I don't understand. Oh, they of course, everything is directed, directed so in their life. And yeah. <laughs> Constantly. Um, I once had a couple ladies in a class like this they were sisters and they told me that they never played as children and I almost didn't believe it. I said never at all no our father made his work and I said well did you ever try hurrying to get done with your work so that you could play no because you just give us more work I said well could you play while you work no it wasn't allowed I said I can't imagine never playing and they said you know what our t children are teaching us how to play, and we're oh. really having a ball. Mm -hmm. 
I'm finding that because we lived on the farm and in the Columbia Basin when we went there, we were pioneers in that area with the water. And so there was a lot of work to be done. And uh, uh, I am my father's daughter, the mechanic in the family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, my brother's the bookkeeper. <laughs> but um, uh, I don't know how to play with my kids. And I'm finding now that with my oldest, I first had to work because I was alone. But um, with these two kids, I've got to be home all the time. And it's a different thing to get down there and be a kid. <laughs> Not only is it hard, it <laughs> some of us have had a hard time learning how to play with our kids, but uh, learning how to play, period. But it is hard to learn to play with your children because it doesn't work to take charge. Then it's no longer play. It's like the teachers on the campus, you know, directing the play, then it's not play. I learned this the hard way also. Uh, the, the boy's older brother was away at college and they had been begging for a long time for his train set. Finally one day, and he was in a generous mood, he was on the phone calling home again. And he said, well, tell the boys they can have my train set. I don't think I'll be needing it for a while. And so I took full advantage of this, of course. First you have to clean your room and you have to do all these things. <laughs> <laughs> then you can get the train out. Well, okay, so it was finally time to get the train out. We set out a board and the two boys were on one side of the table setting up and I was thought, well, I'll help a lot of my trains too. They're my children. <laughs> so, uh, so I got on the other side and, and their goal was to get the engine on the tracks and running. My goal was to create a fancy layout with tunnels and hills and valleys and all this. After a few minutes, mm -hmm. I mean a very few minutes it seemed like to me, when they saw that the engine was not going to have a track to run on anytime soon, they let, lost interest mm -hmm. and never went back. They had satisfied their craving for the train, they got it finally. But it had become mom's project, and so they lost interest, and they never played for the train again. And I felt bad when I realized how I had interfered with their play. I hadn't tried to command them or anything, you know, but just the fact that I was all drawn into this project, and I'm bigger, you know, parents are bigger, they have the final word no matter what. They lost interest, so be careful. Playing with your children, that's the time when they get to boss you around. That's what makes it fun. You know, otherwise they don't want to play with you. <laughs> okay. Any other stories on play? Yes. Well, when I was younger, I grew up in the country. We used to have creek gullies in our pasture, really deep, what we call gullies. And We'd play Land of the Lost, the movie. Like mm -hmm. dinosaurs were coming and we'd hide in the crevices. And <laughs> Again, acting out something that you had seen in order to understand it. Good. Um, my at, 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 in our home, <coughs> when the children were young, the older children were young, I I had a, a phobia of guns, so they were not allowed to have guns, um, and they never got to play cowboys and Indians either. So guess what they played. Israelites and Philistines, <laughs> Samson and I mean uh, David and Goliath. You know they they played what they had available, and the more violent the better, no matter what the stuff background was. <laughs> so now I, I I repent of all of that and I figure well kids will be kids, let them be. That's what they're supposed to be. Okay, is that enough on the subject? I hope you see how instructive play is. How much we learn. Lifetime memories go back to play. You probably remember more about playing than you do about learning in school anyway. So if your children are playing all day long, think of what they're going to remember. Think about what they're going to be learning from that. You can't go wrong if they're just playing. You buy that? <laughs> I hope so. 
think about your own experience as a child and then it'll make sense. Okay, now this afternoon we're going to spend a little time going over the law. Nobody's asked this question. Usually by now somebody said, well, can you do this legally? <laughs> and even though you didn't ask about the law, so you probably won't remember much of what I say, and I feel compelled <laughs> to go through it to make sure that you have the opportunity at least to have your questions answered regarding the legalities in the state of Washington. Um, you might be interested to know <coughs> that homeschooling was legal in the state of Washington for a long time until about 1903. At that point, the law began to change and over a period of a few years, until 1907, it was, it was changing and then in 1907, homeschooling or any other alternative to public and private school was eliminated. It became illegal. And the law then said that all children must attend public school or private school. So uh, while other states had a little more leniency in their laws, uh, Washington was one of the few that had no loopholes, whatever, for homeschooling. And yet, we did homeschool. Um, but when I started, I didn't know there was a legal uh, a, a requirement that you had to send your child to school. I never looked into it. I didn't ask. I thought, well, everybody just does it because they think they have to. You know, like everybody gives their kid a bottle. Well, I don't want to do that. I didn't know there was a law that I was breaking. By the time I found out, it was too late. <laughs> Fortunately for you, that way I had, had an opportunity to set a prison. Now, the only loophole that was available to me was that it does say that the superintendent can temporarily exempt a child from attendance at school if he so chooses. And so that got him off the hook. Now, this law was challenged several times. Um, once in the 40s and again in the 50s. The first case was a, a father who was a public school teacher. But when his child reached the age of eight, he decided he was not going to send him to school. He was going to teach him at home. Of course, he could get away with that for the first eight years in the state. Our, we do have one of the latest compulsory attendance laws, you know, eight instead of five or six or seven. Um, but he was hauled into court, char charged with truancy. And at that time, the judge said it defined school as a place whose business it is to educate children. And obviously, a home is not a business. Therefore, you may not teach them at home. It has to be in school, a business. That's how they defined it. Uh, later in the 50s, an, a mother who had a college degree but not a teaching certificate, as did the former case, um, quietly homeschooled her children and got away with it for a few years. And then somebody reported her and she was hauled into court and charged with truancy. And though she was able to prove with tests and uh, evidences of the, her children's learning that she had more than educated them, you know, as far as the law was concerned, she had provided a very good education and they were well skilled in the, in the common subjects. Nevertheless, the judge had to go by the precedent set now and find her um, guilty of truancy, or her children truant. So, with that kind of a history, by the time we came along, and trying to teach our children at home. We had, it wasn't legal in this state, but at the same time, uh, the public schools were in such bad disarray that in the late 60s and early 70s that they really didn't want to make a case out of this very badly. 
And so there were, uh, we, we I, I haven't found anyone yet that had homeschooled longer than we have, but many people started homeschooling uh, after that. You know, some of them were our friends who said, well, can you do that? And then they decided they wanted to do it too. And then others started popping up around the state until um, by the time we got to 1983 and uh, when we had our first homeschool convention uh, seminar, it, we had about 500 people show up. It was mind-boggling. We did, where were they all coming from? You know, out of the woodwork, all these people that went to homeschool. And that was in 1983. And so it was Dr. Raymond Moore that suggested that we better change our laws. All these people are homeschooling illegally. And that's when we started lobbying and working to get the law changed. So now the law says, all parents in the state of any child eight years of age and under 18 years of age shall cause this child to attend the public school of the district in which the child resides for the two full time when such school may be in session unless the child is attending an approved private school or enrolled in an extension program of a private school provided in the law or the child is receiving home-based instruction as provided in the law. Now I have to apologize, you don't have a copy of the actual law in your textbook. If you, if you want a copy, I can get a copy for you, but as you'll see, it's legalese and it's not that interesting to read. Um, but we will go over it here this afternoon so that you'll know exactly what it says. What you do have is first of all a visual outline on page 30 that we, that you can follow. Is it page 30? Is that what you have? Huh? 25, I'm sorry. Page 25. Um, and then following that is uh, some notes that I will be referring up to some of. And then um, a verbal outline on page 27, which may be a little more detailed and, and you can might want to follow that. The law is basically the same as it was passed in 1985. Uh, a few modifications have been made, very insignificant. Uh, for example, what I just read to you was the way it was passed. However, now that section has an added sentence that says, where it says, child shall attend public school of the district in which the child resides, and such child, child shall have the responsibility to and therefore shall attend. That was added later because of so many teenagers that were truant whom the parents couldn't control. And so this was a way of taking the responsibility, um, or should I, should I say, of relieving the parents of responsibility if they claimed that the child, the teenager, was unmanageable, then because otherwise they'd have to pay a fine if they went to school. Does that make sense? Anyway, so that language was added, but it didn't affect homeschoolers in any way. A few other changes have been made. Okay, so home-based instruction is then defined in the law as consisting, it says, it says, instruction shall be home-based if it consists of planned and supervised instructional and related educational activities, including a curriculum and instruction in, and then it lists 11 subjects, which you'll find outlined, or listed rather, in note number one on page 26. And these are occupational education, science, mathematics, language, social studies, history, health, reading, writing, spelling, and a, the development of an appreciation of art and music. So those are the 11 subjects, art and music counting as one. And then it says, and this instruction is provided for a number of hours equivalent to the total annual program hours per grade level established for approved private schools. In note number two, you have the hours required for approved private schools. However, this language said number of hours equivalent to the total annual hours required for private school. 
that word equivalent was inserted at our request because we felt that homeschoolers shouldn't be held to any hours. After all, the education is going to be going on continuously. And how can we track that? Now, the word equivalent can mean the same as or it can mean equal to. We're not left in the dark because further on the law states, and you'll find this in note number 10, the legislature recognizes that home-based instruction is less structured and more experiential than the instruction normally provided in a classroom setting. Therefore, the provisions of this section relating to the nature, 11 subjects, and quantity, or number of hours, of instructional and related educational activities shall be liberally construed. Again, this is legalese. It basically means that this isn't enforceable. They can't hold you to hours. They can't enforce the subject. There isn't any mechanism written in the law to hold you to those. Does that make sense? You are required to provide instruction in the 11th century, and you know whether you've done that or not. And for the equivalent, so if your child has, uh, you know, based on, say, a standardized achievement test, shown a year's progress after three months of homeschooling, then they've had the equivalent of a year of instruction. Uh, it may take two years for them to do a year's progress. It may take a lot more hours than it would have, or it may take less. It doesn't matter. That's how the law reads. Now, the next section, um, or the next paragraph, is relating to the qualifications. It says a parent of homeschooling, home-based instruction is defined as providing instruction in 11 subjects for equivalent number of hours. And if such instruction is provided by a parent instructing their children to meet certain qualifications, it says A, provided by a parent who is instructing his or her child only and is supervised by a certificated person. That means a teacher. B, provided by a parent who is instructing his or her child only and has either earned 45 college level quarter credit hours or equivalent semester hours, or has completed a course in home-based instruction at a post-secondary institution or vocational technical institute. So I am assuming, you know, since you're taking this class that you will want to qualify under that one. Uh, some of, sometimes people take this class even though they have some college and are already qualified to homeschool, and that's fine. But if you lack qualifications, then this class will qualify you to homeschool. And then there's a third option, or it says C, provided by a parent who is deemed sufficiently qualified to provide home-based instruction by the superintendent of the local district where the child resides. This was intended as a grandfather clause so that parents who were already homeschooling when the law passed wouldn't necessarily have to you know, sign up with a teacher or something like that. For parents now coming in from another state, for example, that have has different requirements. Let's say they have homeschooled for five or ten years and they know what they're doing and they move to Washington and according to the law they, they aren't qualified. Well, they can go to the superintendent and ask him to be unqualified. Um, superintendents sometimes will just say, well, I'll give you qualified temporarily until you take the next available class. Uh, some of them don't want to qualify anybody. Others uh, make their own use of this clause in the law. For example, a superintendent over on the other side of the state who had a 12-year-old drug dealer on campus. So he called the mother in. They can't kick him out, you know. They're required by law to educate him. He called the mother in and said, I deem you qualified. Go and homeschool this kid. Get him out of here. <laughs> well, I, I kind of don't like that use being made of it, but uh, what can we say? You know, they, Now any truant child, it seems, is called homeschooled. And it, it's a, it's 
the superintendents have turned this to their own use to get out of the responsibility for children that are not in school for whatever reason. And that's too bad. But at least we now have the freedom. You know, you, 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 there's always a price to pay. If we want the freedom to homeschool, then we're going to have to have a few families out there that are not doing it sincerely, that are using it to cover up their own laziness or whatever. But by far, the most are very sincere, putting forth the effort to educate their children. And I always ask superintendents when they bring in these other figures about, you know, having to remediate children that come back into the system from homeschooling, and I, I always ask them, did they file a declaration of intent? No, but we know that's what they were doing. I said, no. If they didn't file a declaration of intent, then they're not homeschoolers or truant. You've got to make a difference. So don't add the two together. Well, anyway, they do what they want. Do you happen to know how many people are homeschooling in Washington State now? You know, that's a question that comes up all the time, but no, there's no way of knowing. The, the, the homeschoolers are required to file a declaration, and there is a figure, you know, it's well over 20,000 known homeschoolers. But you don't have to file the declaration of intent until they're eight. And some of them are homeschooling under the supervision of private schools. And some of them are just plain illegal, but bona fide homeschoolers. It's just, I get onto the internet and I get in there and I go to homeschool information and um, most of them highlight it says top 5% of anything people are looking into. Of everything out on the internet, it's top 5% of what people are looking into is homeschooling. Yeah. And, I, and I suspect that here in this state, we are probably well past 3% of the school-aged children are being homeschooled and getting close to the 5%, but that's just, you know, uneducated, yes. Okay. Any, any questions now on on this definition of home-based instruction that we've gone over. The next section deals with the duties of the parent. It says, each parent whose child is receiving home-based instruction shall have the duty to, one, file annually a signed declaration of intent that he or she is planning to cause his or her child to receive home-based instruction. The statement shall include the name and age of the child, shall specify whether a certificated person will be supervising the instruction, and shall be written in a format prescribed by the superintendent of public instruction. Now, if you turn to page 30, you'll see the format that the SBI has come out with. And basically, it just shows you what the law just asked for. The child's name and birth date instead of age, that's the same and a place for your name and address. There's also a little box in the middle to, for you to check if you're supervised by a teacher. You see that? That line right across the middle underneath the blank for the names. So uh, after you've completed this class, you don't need to be supervised by a teacher. And so you don't need to check that box, just leave it blank. Some schools change the format a little bit. Now, if they give you 16 pages of questionnaire, I would say throw it away. And turn it over. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> you know, demand that that they give you a proper form because this is what's required by law. Anything beyond this, you don't have to answer. Sometimes I just throw in a few more questions. Excuse me. One one school district in this vicinity added uh, how you qualify. They want you to specify how you qualify. That's not required by law. They have to be, you know, they have to presume that you're qualified and if you didn't check that box. Uh, sometimes they'll ask last, what was the last grade competed or what was the last school you went to or, you know, whatever little curious questions they might have. You can fill it in by saying not applicable or not required. Yes. Um, She's, she doesn't speak English. Um, she was asking me if I could teach her kids 
things too. Like the um, more of it, I'm sure she'll do her part in it, but mm -hmm. um, the structure, like, would I be able to? Okay, that's a good question. Um, and I have to answer it carefully. You may teach your children because you've taken this class or you have college or whatever and qualify. Your mother may teach her children if she qualifies. Then, as it says later here and we'll read it in a minute, all decisions are left up to the parent as to how you do it. So if you wanted to send your children to grandma to be educated or grandma, want, you know, she wants to have you educate her children, that decision is left up to the parent, provided the parent qualifies. What if she has, she would, even if she came to this class, she wouldn't understand how would she qualify? Okay, that has not been addressed. What the way I usually counsel people is that uh, two, two things they can do. One is sign an affidavit saying that you're the, in local parentis, that's a legal term meaning in the place of the parent, <coughs> you have um, legal custody for purposes of education of the child. The other thing to do is if she wants to, she can come to class and bring an interpreter. That has been done in the case of a deaf person. Because, that, you know, at least they could sign that didn't disrupt the class. I'm not sure how it would work if somebody, I haven't had the opportunity to see if that would work if somebody wanted to translate, but it might be possible if she wanted to do it that way. Um, that, the idea is that, that we want parents to be free to be able to educate their children there needs to be some trade-off for the to assure that they're assuming the responsibility properly, and this is how it came out. You know, so that the yeah, parent would take it. The, the certain people in the legislature wanted all parents to have to work under the supervision of a teacher, and we rejected that. We said that's okay as an option, but some of us don't want to work under the supervision of a teacher. And so the trade-off was, and it, well then how about if you have a little more education or you know, a class like this. Also, when the law was passed, they had a problem with unapproved church schools who felt that the children belonged to God and not to the state and they shouldn't have to be answerable for what went on in the church school and so on. The legislature wanted to resolve this. You know, Technically they were uh, breaking the law, but there should be a way around it for special cases like that. So that, though it's not written in here, it's with the understanding that if several parents want to get together and have a little cooperative school or church school or whatever you want to call it, they can do that outside of the law as long as each of those parents is legally qualified to homeschool. And they file a declaration of intent, do you understand? Then they, the parent has assumed responsibility, that's what the Declaration of Intent is. And then they can do whatever they want to. Yes? Yeah. I have a question in a different direction. Once you file your annual, or your first mm -hmm. Declaration of Intent, how can we go about getting all, or at least copies of their school records? Just ask for them. Just ask for them? Because I know that at any time a parent can go in and request that by law and they have to give them to you, but I've done this before and they refuse to give it to me. They can't refuse to give it to you. So I can I can make sure that I have everything if from they kindergarten all the yeah. way through. They said have a lawyer write the letters they refuse. Okay. Because yeah. legally they cannot refuse. <coughs> Better yet, just go to the superintendent. Go over the head of the <laughs> school person that said no. I have a question in regards to, is it your mother-in-law? Is she married? She's married. Can the, can the father then just get qualified and then does he speak again? Yes, they're both on the home. Well, that question does yeah, come up, though. Yeah. If if the mother's not qualified, can the father be the qualified person, though he's gone most of the time and mother's teaching? And my response to that is, theoretically, yes. 
but I would use it only as a stack up temporary measure. Uh, get, get qualified as soon as you can because you never know what might happen. And you have to put the kids back in school, you know, and, uh, on a moment's notice if a disaster occurred. So uh, go ahead and start homeschooling, but try to get qualified. What do we do about school uh, records? Now we're coming to that. Okay. If you can bear with me just a minute. And let's deal with the Declaration of Intent. It says, each parent shall file the statement by September 15 of the school year or within two weeks of the beginning of any public school quarter trimester or semester with the superintendent of the public school district in which the parent resides. So if in this state we have joint custody and the family split up, then both parents would have to file a declaration of intent. I don't know that they're pushing that, but both parents would have to? It says where the parent resides. What if the child is If they're both in the same district, of course, it wouldn't matter. What if the child has legal else? placement with one parent as a legal guardian and the other is the opposite parent? In actual practice, my understanding is that it only it ends up being where the child resides, but technically, the way the law is worded, both parents would have to file if they share custody. That's a joint custody basis. Well, in this state, that's what we have. All right. Joint custody. Exactly. Now, I, I wouldn't hassle it. Nobody's doing anything about it. I'm just saying this is what the law is. Okay. If, if, if they, if, ask you can do it then that's soon enough <laughs> but uh, I, I believe the way they're treating it is, is as if it said where the child is okay. just so you won't be surprised <laughs> <laughs> any other questions on the filing of the declaration of intent what this does basically is assume you it you're telling the superintendent that you've assumed responsibility for this child's education. Okay? And so anything after that is up to you and not up to the school district. Okay, the second duty is to ensure that test scores or annual academic progress assessments and immunization records together with any other records that are kept relating to the instructional and educational activities provided are forwarded to any other public or private school to which the child transfers. Now it doesn't say here you have to keep records, it just says you have to have them so that if the child goes back to school, you've got some records to furnish them. Okay, so the only records that are required are test scores or annual progress assessments and immunization records if you have those. Okay, any questions on that? At the time of transfer to the public school, the superintendent of the district may require standardized achievement tests be administered and shall have the authority to determine the appropriate grade and course level placement of the child after consultation with parents and review the child's record. So what this is saying is when you put, if you put your child back in school, it's up to them to decide what grade goes into. You, they're supposed to take into consideration your views on the matter. That says after consultation with the parent. But it's up to them. Most schools are just glad to get them back and they'll do whatever you ask. Or you can review testing later. That's coming up after this, yeah. But you, so you had, somebody back there had a question on, on records. Right. Um, okay. This is the time. Just on their academic things. I, I assume the test scores here are the SATs? Standardized achievement test. Okay. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. What about their, their work that they do? Um, nothing is required, but if you keep any records, then whatever records you keep should be submitted if the child goes back to school. Only at that point? Yeah. No other records are required. Now, 
I have to say that at one point in the process of getting this law passed, there was an amendment added here in which we would be required, well actually it did start out as an amendment. The first time that the bill was drafted, they had on there that we had to keep attendance records and grade records. I'm sorry, just attendance at home. Yeah, right. Fine. And that's what I said. <laughs> you know, give me a break. The kids are home all the time. Yeah. Perfect <laughs> attendance. I mean, can you beat it? And so I went to one of the legislators and I said, you know, this doesn't make sense. Why should we have to keep grade and attendance records at home? He said, well, what do you do when your children do a good job? I said, well, give them a hug and a kiss and a pat on the back. He said, good, that's what I wanted you to say. Now, I'll take care of your amendment. And so the next day at the hearing, he proposed amending this out of the law, out of the bill. He said, I'm told that homeschoolers sometimes just give their kids a hug and a kiss and a pat on the back. How are we going to record those? Everybody laughed and they voted on the amendment and, it, and, and so they got it passed. <laughs> so it could have been different, but <laughs> yeah. this is the way it came out. We don't have to keep records. Yes. Is, is this so as, as far as when they get into high school grades? <coughs> There's no record keeping. What do they do about having this for future reference, for going to college, for... There is none. Uh, There's no mechanism to uh, get a uh, graduation from high school and ho from homeschooling. Uh, there are ways of doing it, but nothing is written in the law. Through our Christian curriculum. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, any school in the state of Washington issuing a diploma sets up their own standards as far as accepting um, credit from other institutions. For example, if you're enrolled in a, in a uh, correspondence course, the school is not obligated to accept those credits. <coughs> for graduation purposes. At the same time, there are no laws regulating the writing of diplomas in this state. So any parent can write a diploma, and it's just as good as the paper it's written on. Um, what do you want with this anyway? What kind of, why do you want a record of their education? Well, I'm progress? just curious as to, um, going on to school. Now, I now if your my question husband, is, if your my husband didn't graduate from high school and he's going on to college, but yeah, that's gonna, that's what I'm saying. If your question is, how do we get into college? I can answer that. Colleges want homeschoolers. You can, you'll get the royal treatment if you apply to college. Doesn't matter if you have any diploma or or a report card or credits or anything. They don't care. Yeah, I just looking at newspapers. If you want to a child who turns 18 wants to go get a job and is, and is interested, a lot of newspaper ads say must have high school diploma or something. Um, if he was homeschooled, then you know, the, will they waive that? Will they take it? Yeah, into they will. Uh, but what a lot of homeschoolers do just to make it easier on everybody is take the GED, um, and it's equivalent to a high school diploma. I was told, well, in fact, my uh, cousin's boy um, homeschooled, and uh, in comparison with what he learned in homeschooling and what he took his GED, he said it was like taking freshman tests. Actually, <laughs> about uh, about 49% uh, of high school seniors will flunk the GED. 100% mm -hmm. uh, of homeschoolers pass it, and usually in the 80th, and many of them in the 90th percentile. So uh, we've already made our case. Colleges will not turn you away if you're homeschooled. My experience with the GED is more common sense than anything, and that's why most of your homeschoolers will pass it. Sure. And that's the only certificate you get homeschooling is a GED. If you want, to, yeah. If you want, you to. don't have to have that. I know. I know one young man that was accepted in a. A college in upstate New York with nothing. He had no GED, he had no report card, he had no credits, he was homeschooled all his life, he had nothing to show for it. They welcomed him with open arms because they know the homeschool kids are good students and they know what they're there for. So I wouldn't worry about that. Yes? 
Um, Dr. James Dobson said just here a couple of weeks ago on radio that there are six homeschoolers right now at Harvard. Mm -hmm. So, Air Force Academy. Yeah, it's he was really stressing that as well that it is not a problem for no. homeschoolers to get into no. any That's right. of our colleges or universities. I, I get letters from colleges saying, please send us homeschoolers. <laughs> we want them. We'll waive entrance for funds. We'll give them uh, scholarships. We don't care. We want them. <laughs> Did you Boston <laughs> <laughs> University for what? Okay. Well, I had an experience just the day before I left to come up here. I was at work and I have one client that is a retired physician. And he, I told him I was going to be gone for a week and we got into a discussion of why. And I told him, well, my first reaction I get from anybody I tell this to, <laughs> why do you want to homeschool? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then I explain, and then they're kind of sitting there like, my question to him was, when you went to medical school, or college and medical school, weren't there any homeschoolers? And they, well, yes, there was. And he said, they're all physicians that went, were homeschooled and went on to college. And I'm going, there's your answer. One reason the colleges want homeschoolers is the main reason because their grades are higher? Or is it another factor? I don't think it's grades. I, I think that they, I it's the score. College isn't like high school. When you get into college, it's more self-directed. You have to have some idea of what you want to get out of it. Granted, for the last few decades, college has been too much like high school but it's not supposed to be. You're supposed to go to college because you want a career, you want a, 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 an occupation, a, a profession, whatever. And you go there to get that. And so you're supposedly going there because you want to know how to do this profession or whatever. And most of the kids that come out of high school don't have a clue. But the homeschool kids do. For one thing, often they turn college down as beneath them. <laughs> one of my boys went off to a four-year college, and and after a few months, he said, "Mom, these kids are so juvenile." <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, nah. "After about a year, he said, can I drop out? I don't. I think this is a waste of time.'" I said, "Well, sure. I didn't tell you to go there in the first place." <laughs> So he, he did take a correspondence course in the field that he was interested in. Uh, I think colleges are going to have to learn if they're going to keep attracting homeschoolers. They're going to have to change some of the rules, like, for example, that you all have to have English, math, psychology, Western arts, and all this stuff. You know, either they're going to be self-directed or they're not. And if they have these requirements for graduation, it should be at least related to the field and not all this other stuff. My, my husband's doing electro, um, industrial electrical and electronic, and he's now trying to stumble through English. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it has absolutely nothing teacher. to do with the computer yeah. board. <clears throat> or the wiring of one. <laughs> well, their whole educational uh, idea needs to be rethought, I think. To better serve the people, but anyway, that was to answer your question. Um, I think we we we're going to have to take a little break here, so uh, we'll come back to discussing the testing after we get it. Are there any other questions on this keeping the records? I think we pretty well covered that. Yes, I did have a question. Um, it. Never mind, it applies to the testing, so we will look. Okay, we'll do the testing as soon as we get back from the break. Uh, let's make it a short break. Mm -hmm.